Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Again, from uh, Eccles Marketing Service, uh, the bio, I got my bio actually in there. We do a variety of things, everything from market news to check off oversight, a variety of things. That, and I talk about a very narrow activity here, uh, the USDA ISO TS 34700 Animal Welfare Assessment Program. It really rolls off the tongue. For marketing agency, we do a terrible job of, of de developing uh, catchy little titles for our programs. But I think it's important before you all kind of look at your uh, iPhones and say this is, I'm going to check out here for a little while. I like to talk about why it's important. Um, uh, actually, in the room is Emily Meredith from National Milk, Chief of Staff. Uh, she and I have been working on this activity for several years now. Um, really why we announced this program is for these three bullets. Uh, frankly, if widely implemented, if this program is implemented, if the standards that we're going to talk about are widely implemented by the private sector, so again, not the public sector, the private sector, it could facilitate the adoption of what we call the OIE, and I'm going to give you these acronyms later and explain what they mean, animal welfare standards in developing countries and improve the living conditions of animals raised for food production around the world. And why that's really, really important is this uh, initiative that we've undertaken the last several years actually does enjoy support from the animal welfare organizations. Uh, as we work on this standard, uh, the Humane Society of the United States, uh, Humane Society International, a lot of the organizations that in some respects are diametrically opposed to the interests of, of uh, livestock producers, um, they actually supported this initiative, and that's really where the U.S. government saw an opportunity for us to uh, sort of move forward in a way that we could all recognize that if there are issues in animal welfare in the United States, in the developed world, uh, we can agree to disagree on potentially some of those issues, but I think we can all acknowledge uh, that animal agriculture is often defined, unfortunately, uh, by its weakest links, and oftentimes the conditions of animals raised for food production in the developing world are the examples that are showed to consumers in countries like the United States or in Europe uh, that really embody uh, what's wrong with uh, animal production uh, for food. And so one of the things that we really focused on in the development of this uh, standard and this assessment program is a way that those most egregious forms of animal abuse, uh, nobody in animal agriculture uh, should defend, can be taken off the table and said that those have no place, uh, frankly, in food production. That's why the animal welfare organizations can sort of put in the parking lot some of the differences they have with production practices in the United States or in the developing world to say we can all agree that some of the things that do occur around the world uh, need to be addressed. The second thing is it establishes a strong framework for ensuring that industry animal welfare standards and programs are rooted in science, not pseudoscience, but actually true science. So if somebody is purporting to have an animal welfare program, this standard and the assessment program we developed at USDA can ensure that all of those requirements are truly science-based. If they choose to do other things, uh, like cage-free bands or things like that, they can choose to do that. But the assessment program can look at something and determine whether or not their requirements meet all of the scientific requirements of the animal welfare program. So are these animal welfare systems that industry is putting in place, do they meet all the requirements of one that is truly science-based? Again, uh, consumers might want to go further in things that they believe uh, what should be in an animal welfare program. Programs can do that, but at least it establishes a minimum threshold that a program that is purporting itself to be an animal welfare program uh, can say that, yes, uh, it meets at least the scientific requirements of an animal welfare system. And then finally, and this is one of the things that I think is most important for industry, as uh, auditing, and, and obviously we've got Sean in the room, um, audit fatigue, audit costs are things that are real issues uh, for animal agriculture. Uh, not only for livestock producers, but the entire uh, supply chain. And one of the things that this program can do is help minimize the cost to both small-scale and large-scale livestock producers and other market participants by them not having to undergo multiple audits to demonstrate to multiple customers that they actually have a scientifically-based animal welfare system that meets international standards. And so if you're selling into multiple different markets, those markets, if they choose to, can say, we just want to make sure that your program is science-based. You meet all the requirements of a science-based animal welfare program. This assessment can help demonstrate that, and then potentially then you're not subjected to multiple audits at a cost to you oftentimes that, at the end of the day, don't necessarily uh, bring you any additional profit for your products. So, again, kind of stepping back, AMS, uh, why is AMS in it? AMS is somewhat of a unique agency at USDA. We actually like to say we truly are here to help, uh, which the government says in everything it does. In this case, uh, this is a voluntary program that we've announced. Uh, it, why did tax dollars go to uh, the development of the standard? Uh, frankly, because the U.S. government believes 
uh, that by having agreement by groups like the animal welfare organizations and livestock agriculture come to agreement to address certain issues. Uh, this is something that could help bring efficiencies to the system and again internationally can help protect the image of, of livestock agriculture which is something that is in our interest because it's a, it's a huge net benefit to uh, uh, U.S. trade actually not only internationally but obviously domestically. So our mission at AMS is to facilitate the competitive and efficient marketing of agricultural products and we think that this program clearly fits into that scope and to our mission and um, we host we carry out a variety of programs that kind of address that. And frankly I think we're a small enough group that if you guys have any questions at any time just go ahead and let's, let's just have a dialogue. Again, uh, I'm from the government, so I've got this massive Rolodex of acronyms, and I love to use them. Um, but there are two I'm going to use several times here today, and so I just want to make sure you understand what they mean. One is ISO, and the other is OIE. These are two very different organizations that do very different things for different audiences, um, but they are very intertwined in what I'm going to talk about. So let me kind of explain what these two organizations are. A few words about ISO. So ISO is the first one, and ISO is the one that actually developed the standard that USDA has developed the assessment system to. The ISO um, stands for the International Organization for Standardization. You're going to say, within why isn't IOS? ISO, it's, it's actually uh, the acronym for its French. The ISO is based in Paris, France. They developed, I'm sorry, it's based in Geneva, Switzerland, because it's a French-speaking part of uh, uh, Switzerland. The ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, is a network of 163 different national institutes. The United States is represented in the ISO through what's called uh, NIST, which is the, or ANSI, actually, American National Standards Institute, under the framework of the federal government with NIST. But ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, is technically the U.S. member body to the ISO. And every country that participates, participates through their member body. Um, the standards are developed by industry experts, experts in that field. Um, you've probably heard of ISO standards, and I'm going to talk in the next slide about some very uh, popular ISO standards. But for those of you who are old enough to remember actually putting film in a camera, you probably remember ISO 200 speed film, 400 speed film. Those were ISO standards about the performance of film. And so you could buy Fuji 400 speed film, or you could buy Kodak 400 speed film, and you know that both of those met at least a minimum uh, a performance requirement. So that's what ISO does. It develops industry standards that companies can kind of compete on a level playing field and produce products basically around who can produce that product, which meets a minimum requirement as efficiently as possible, as inexpensively as possible, uh, to meet all the other requirements of the marketplace, but not have to worry about uh, two products in the marketplace uh, with one not necessarily meeting a minimum requirement. So a buyer could buy either product for whatever reason they choose, but know both products at least met minimum standards. And that's important to kind of remember because that's really what this ISO 34,700 standard does, is it says all of these animal welfare systems at least meet a minimum requirement. You may choose one system over another, but at least you know they all potentially meet a, 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 a given uh, set of standards. So they have about 100,000 different experts that help write, help write their standards. Uh, what ISO did was develop an international group of experts in the field of animal welfare. Uh, actually, uh, Emily Meredith and I both served uh, as experts representing the United States in that activity and uh, helped contribute to the development of this standard. But again, we also had representatives from animal welfare organizations and a variety of others uh, that helped uh, divide, define actually the ISO animal welfare standard. But for all the standards they developed, they identify experts, uh, not only from government, but in industry, academia, a variety of fields to help write the ISO standards. And again, it's based in Geneva, Switzerland. So if you talk about ISO standards, I talk about the film standards, which I think are commonly known by people of an older generation like me, but obviously some of the ones that are used very commonly that you've probably heard of are ISO 9000 series standards for quality management systems, 26,000 for social responsibility, 22,000 for food safety management, 17025, uh, which are the minimum requirements of a, like a laboratory uh, to meet uh, the quality uh, requirements of a lab to have good results that come out of the lab. At USDA, for example, uh, when we have people do our microbiology testing, so like we buy about $2.8 billion in food each year for federal feeding programs, like the National School Lunch Program. All the ground beef that we buy has to be tested to ensure that it's free of uh, um, H3 coli, O157H7, or salmonella, a variety of other things. We require that that testing be done by labs that are 17025 accredited. So that's why these standards are important, because you know the results that come out of those labs, for example, are reliable, that you can trust those results. And then 17065 is conformity assessment, 
And that's the basis of things that we do to determine that, for example, certifiers do their jobs uh, well. So like at USDA, for example, when we accredit a, a, a certifying agency to be an accredited, for example, organic certifying agency to be able to have producers under them apply the USDA organic seal, we assess them essentially, ostensibly under the 17065 standard, for example. And John, uh, we have a program where we assess IMI Global under the 17065 and say they are a very reliable certification body. So OIE, so that's ISO, they develop industry consensus standards, USDA, government participates in that, but so does industry, so does academia, everybody comes up with these standards that everybody agrees are very good. OIE is very different. OIE uh, stands for the World Organization for Animal Health. They are based in Paris. They uh, also, acronyms all messed up because it's, it's based off of the French uh, um, translation, but they are an intergovernmental organization. And by that I mean it's only governments. Governments sit in the OIE and the governments basically debate the development of OIE standards. So there's, there, although there's industry participation, the only people who vote in the process are the governments. And the U.S. Uh, is represented by our Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service at USDA to help develop OIE standards. OIE standards are developed uh, through a, a member body of 180 different countries. Uh, obviously, the USDA is one. And they do promote animal welfare because they see there's a clear link between animal welfare and animal health. So the true mission of OIE is ensuring the uh, health of, of livestock around the world to ensure that animal diseases do not move from market to market. When we talk about trade issues between foreign markets, one of the things that we always look at before we allow foreign meat products, for example, to come into the United States is could those meat products bring foreign, foreign animal diseases into our country? And really what we look to are these OIE standards to ensure that if those countries, those government country, you know, the governments of those countries, have certain requirements in place that protects the U.S. livestock herd from, from these foreign animal diseases. But one of the areas that they've gotten very involved in is animal welfare standards. And if you really look at the animal welfare standards they have, they have general principles, they have transportation of, of uh, animals raised for food production, transportation by land, tra trucks, transportation by sea, by boat, transportation by air. They have slaughter standard for animal welfare, beef cattle standards for production on farm, broiler chickens, dairy cattle, and uh, soon they're going to be working on their swine and egg layer. And obviously the, the reason that those have been two of the more contentious and, and were really last to come on board are issues like uh, gestation crates, issues like uh, battery cage egg production. And some of those, those, those issues are going to have to be debated. And they're going to be debated um, you know, very vigorously by the governments to governments because as we know there are national bans on certain forms of production in those two systems uh, internationally. But there are limitations to OIE standards. As I said, ISO standards, those are adopted by industry. So any company in the most undeveloped part of the world or developing part of the world can produce a very high quality product using ISO standards because you can drive down a dirt road and come up on a manufacturing facility and see very high tech equipment coming out of the facility because they're audited to ISO standards, be it 9000 or 17025 or whatever. The industry, private sector, really ensures that even in developing parts of the world, uh, processes can be very reliable, uh, very high quality, uh, even if there's no national framework, no government framework making that so. And so the limitation of the OIE, because it's intergovernmental, they're really dependent on, in the case of animal health, they're really dependent on that country having a strong, as we have in the United States, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Not every country in the world has the resources that we have at USDA to ensure protection of our herd health, to ensure protection of our plant health, to monitor our borders for uh, livestock and livestock products that are coming into our country, to sit at the table with foreign markets and negotiate the things that we do to ensure that our products won't be a risk to their uh, livestock herd, those sorts of issues. Not every country has those resources. So OIE standards, although are very science-based, are very good standards, they're really dependent on government bodies to carry them out, and that's a big limitation. Another limitation of OIE standards is they're very what we call outcome-based. And by outcome-based, I mean they don't really tell you how to get to the outcome. They just describe what the outcome should be. So they really accommodate different regulatory frameworks in different countries. If you read, for example, the Code of Federal Regulations in the United States, it might read very differently than if you were to open up uh, in the Euro European Union their regulations. But we're both saying we reach the same outcome. And I like to liken it to... An OIE standard is sort of like reading somebody describing what a recipe tastes like in the end. They don't tell you how to cook it. They just tell you what it's going to taste like in the end. What ISO does a lot more of is really tell you the process to get there. OIE is very outcome-based. 
And so ISO standards, when you read them, are much more detailed about all the things you have to do to get there, whereas the OIE chapters really talk about what it's like when you're there. And they put the pressure on the government to come up with that process to get there, if that makes sense. So the intergovernmental, they're dependent on national governments with the resources like the United States has to ensure that it gets done, <laughs> to look at this very outcome-based standard and come up with a process to arrive at that outcome. Uh, governmental regulations of animal welfare, as we know, uh, really vary around the world. So although pure animal health, control of things like trichina or foot and mouth disease or some of these things that are priorities for many, many countries, animal welfare not necessarily so. And so animal welfare at the government level, uh, even in the United States, uh, there's not a lot of national on-farm animal welfare regulation. It's handled often uh, through a different regulatory framework, through localities and, and other means. And obviously we depend very heavily in the United States on industry uh, to do the right thing and set industry standards and, and handle it through that framework. So. Animal welfare varies around the globe, uh, certainly as it's, it's regulated. And then much of the international livestock production uh, occurs under, as I said, these private sector animal welfare schemes that work to ensure uh, animal welfare. So look at things like the National Milk Farm Program, look at the BQA program for NCBA, look at the PQA Plus program that the Pork Board develops. We in the United States, when we meet with foreign countries, for example, uh, when we're communicating with Europe in a potential uh, TTIP agreement, we're really talking a lot about what industry does on their own in the framework to ensure animal welfare here and saying that collectively comes up with a system. In certain countries, though, it's much more regulated at the national level, certainly in Europe it is. And so that's, that's one of the things that you have international livestock production is oftentimes industry standards take it. And that's where OIE kind of comes a little short because these are governmental uh, standards and they're very outcome based. So let's put all these pieces together. We've got AMS, this government agency at USDA that, that works to facilitate the marketing of U.S. agricultural products. We have ISO that develops industry consensus standards that are used by industry to ensure that products or processes meet a desired outcome. OIE is an intergovernmental organization that has, as I said, already developed a whole host of animal welfare standards, and then we have this issue of animal welfare. So recognizing that... Uh, um, it was important for the United States for a variety of reasons to, as I said in the beginning, uh, do what we could to improve the living conditions of animal raised for food production in the developing world, uh, to do what we can to minimize the cost being uh, thrown on small and large producers uh, that are being subjected to audits for animal welfare, and then, uh, frankly, most importantly, that we could demonstrate that anybody that's out there purporting to have an animal welfare program, that that program is truly rooted in science. It meets all of the scientific requirements. <clears throat> We started on what became a five-year journey uh, to develop this uh, tool, as we've called it. It's an ISO standard, a tool that could be used by industry to further the international adoption of the OIE standards and ensure that any industry animal welfare scheme at least met the science-based uh, requirements of the OIE. And why the OIE is really important is the OIE, by definition of being intergovernmental, um, it, it, it is a little more immune that, to the pseudoscience than some of the industry schemes. A lot of the industry programs out there add a lot of feel-good requirements that really consumers intuitively think are animal welfare, but aren't necessarily science-based. OIE standards, because of the process that they go through, the input that we get, uh, obviously, from industry and advising the government on how to set uh, OIE standards, and because the OIE standards are really designed around all 180 member countries being able to trade with each other, are written at the science minimum. And so they're literally the minimum requirements and not necessarily all the other things that certain customers may desire, but at least those minimum requirements. And so it was important if for the ISO we were going to develop a standard, it would be rooted in something that everybody agreed were science-based and not necessarily influenced by perception or pseudoscience. So this ISO tool, and then we're going to talk about that in a minute, this ISO tool that we developed is really all about ensuring that any industry program met those outcome-based requirements of the OIE. So where are we today? Five years we worked on developing this ISO standard. It's called Technical Specification 34700. It was completed and published in December of, of 2016. It was officially launched actually at the OIEs every four years. They have a, a world uh, conference in animal health. It was rolled out there. Instead of us then having all this public investment in the development of an international standard, we thought it best to not just leave it sitting on the shelf. What we then rolled out as a companion program at AMS was an assessment program where industry associations, you know, like a National Milk with its farm program or a NCBA with a BQA program, or even an individual company or individual producer that has an animal welfare program could have it assessed 
by USDA, by our auditors, to determine whether or not it at least met all of the minimum science-based requirements of an animal welfare program. So taking that, that wealth of knowledge and those OIE standards, those governmental standards, outcome-based, we have now developed a, an assessment program to this ISO standard, which is this tool, to say that, yes, your program meets all the requirements of a true animal welfare program. And why that's really, really important for us is it allows these programs to begin to communicate. So if we have an on-farm program, we have a trans uh, there's another industry uh, sec sector that has a transportation program. Uh, let's look at like the AMI, Animal Handling Guidelines. They have a very good slaughter standard. Those programs can begin to communicate. And so if you're buying, let's say, a meat product that came from livestock under one program, um, produced under one program, livestock transported under another program, and livestock slaughtered under a third program, all three of those programs could be assessed to say they all meet those minimum requirements and they can kind of talk with each other. Similarly, if you're a buyer of livestock products and you've got products coming from one country where they're using one program and another country you're using another program, instead of you having to go out and independently assess that both programs meet your needs, both programs can be assessed and ensure that both programs meet at least minimum requirements. So you as a buyer can say, look, I buy from a variety of different programs, but every one of those programs meets at least this minimum standard. So as a company, as a buyer, I can attest all of my products meet that. And that's one of the other groups that really supported the development of this ISO standard, and that was the multinational firms. So it was the large-scale buyers of your products that really supported, in large measure, the U.S. government getting involved in this and ISO getting involved in this because they saw it as a way for supply chain management. Um, uh, certain large companies don't want to fly their auditors all over the world to make sure that products that are, that are moving from one market to the other necessarily meet all of their particular requirements. They want animal welfare in some cases to be a non-competitive issue. Everything can be assessed in this way. So we developed this. We announced it very soon after the publication of the ISO standard. We announced it in December 27. Again, it's to allow existing animal welfare programs to be assessed by AMS to determine if they conform to TS 34700 and by extension, the OAE chapters, and uh, we posted that program on our website. What's important uh, to say there is we aren't viewing this as another audit of producers. This is an assessment of a program. And in that way, that program can continue to operate as is with no additional cost uh, to producers. Certainly, we're not looking for another logo on a package of product. Uh, we don't want our, our meat products to look like NASCARs or anything like that. We, we absolutely look at this as a way, as, as a background, that people can at least have confidence that the program that they developed or that they're audited and under meets uh, certain requirements. Multiple goals, again, as I said, to aid in the impl implementation of the OIE animal welfare uh, standards for animals raised for food around the world. Um, the OIE actually strongly supported this. There was an MOU that was signed between the OIE and ISO where, where OIE said, look, we recognize there's limitations on getting OIE chapters adopted internationally. ISO, you do a really good job of getting your um, uh, standards adopted. Help us, private sector, help uh, the intergovernmental. And so uh, OIE is very supportive of this because they know this furthers the international adoption of the OIE code, uh, not only reflects well on animal uh, agriculture, but if we recognize that animal welfare has a role in animal health, it furthers animal health internationally, which is the core tenets of the OIE. To ensure that any program purported, and that's important to say purported, to mean an animal welfare program is science-based and meets all of the requirements of the OIE, that's very important. We see a lot of people out there purporting programs as animal welfare. This is a way to determine whether or not they meet all of the true requirements of an animal welfare program. It maintains the OIE, and this is very important. Uh, I think industry was very supportive of this, and welfare organizations were very supportive of this. Industry was very supportive of this. It maintains OIE <coughs> as really the authority and what is or is not animal welfare. We're not going to let that get defined somewhere else. Uh, so rooting the ISO standard back to the OIE was, was a, a core tenant really from day one. And then again, as we sort of started with, it minimizes the number of audits that livestock producers and other market participants in, endure. Because if these broader programs are assessed, they can be begin to communicate with each other. It allows the buyers of livestock and livestock products to require an overarching uh, requirement of 34,700 compliance. And by that, uh, a number of different programs that are already out there today uh, hopefully can, can be assessed to determine uh, in compliance. It facilitates international trade uh, as, as the 34,700 can bring together different animal welfare systems and various markets and supply chains and it accommodates animal welfare programs that exceed. And I think that was one of the things that the, especially the animal welfare organizations were really passionate about. Uh, they do advocate, certainly in the developed world, uh, certain programs that go well beyond what's scientifically required, uh, that are a lot more uh, consumer focused, uh, basically saying that you can do that, that's fine, as long as they meet the minimum. 
but it also recognizes, let's say, in, in the most developing part of the world, that the animal welfare programs that they may implement also are science-based. Again, it establishes a framework that can be used by other countries on how to assess existing animal welfare programs. Uh, what USDA did not want to do is develop an animal welfare program. There is no USDA, AMS, animal welfare program. We wanted a way that we could look at these existing programs and say they meet certain requirements and provides an easy to use and understand checklist. And that's what we've done with this assessment is develop checklists. We're working with industry right now on these checklists so that auditors, when they go out, know exactly what to look for. And more importantly, the audited or the being assessed uh, know exactly what to expect um, when an auditor arrives. It gives you a way to sort of look at your own animal welfare program, even on your own, and do a self-assessment um, before an independent assessment or third-party assessment is conducted. So where are we at? Uh, as, a, as I said, the ISO published their standard in 2016. Um, uh, it's in a three-year what they call trial period. Any new ISO standard goes through a three-year trial period. It's in what's called its implementation period. And so we're feeding information back to the ISO on how well that standard's being adopted. Any problems with the adoption? Are there glitches? You know, when it was written, are there errors in the standard? And at the end of that three-year period, uh, the group of us that helped write the standard are going to gather back together and determine whether or not modifications to the standard need to be made or potentially, if we do not feel it's, it's, it's achieving its intended effect, uh, withdraw the standard itself or continue it on. So we're in this implementation period until uh, 2019. So when you get into the details of the assessment program, um, again, uh, any individual and company, right now we're very focused on the trade associations because they have the most uh, impactful animal welfare programs that, that really hit the most uh, producers out there. We're working with them uh, to see if they want to have their programs assessed. We want to work with them to develop these checklists that can be made publicly available. And then, obviously, we can begin the assessments. Uh, the assessments include the scope of the organization's program. And so, again, it doesn't have to be a farm to fork program. It can be a segment. As I said, the, I, the OIE chapters are very specific to things like slaughter, transport, on farm, those sorts of things. And so the assessment will be limited to the portion of that animal welfare program. And those are, obviously, annual assessments. So the process. Uh, Follows the audit uh, process highlighted, and we have a procedure. Uh, everything we do has a procedure uh, where you apply for the service, you go through what we call a desk audit, you send in your written program, we do a desk audit, uh, and then based on that, uh, we come back and do an on site audit to make sure that you're following through in practice, uh, which you report to, to be doing on, on paper, and then uh, you're listed obviously uh, on our website as, as accredited.
other side of the same thing that I did not support it. So I'm kind of too tired. Um, however, I think the conversation has broadened. I think our, our farmers and ranchers have become far more sophisticated in, in engaging in that conversation, actually engaging in science, uh, seeing the recent uh, changes with regard to looking at having assessments on farms, being able to tolerate having a third party monitor, and so on to come in and verify. And even though we would like to think, as we did maybe 50 years ago, nobody had to do that, um, we're just living in a very different environment, and it's not going to get any easier. Probably one of the uh, broadening the discussion a bit was to look at this from a systems-based uh, perspective as well. It's not just animal welfare. It's a matter of looking at these animal production uh, units as a system. And we have a system that has a multitude of issues that are placed within that. And so, um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Coalition for Sustainable Egg Supply. It's a project, a private public private partnership that came together to be able to look at the different types of systems that we understood that our industry would be gravitating to, that in particular is the egg industry. Um, but looking at it from a multi-dimensional standpoint, because many times when farmers and ranchers are asked to make these changes that are solely based on animal welfare, there are other implications for other parts of that system that we may not talk about. Uh, using litter in an egg layer system certainly accommodates the types of behaviors we'd like to see accommodated within that system. However, you also have high air density of dust, you have particulates that can carry more bacterial load, you have it being exhausted <coughs> into the air. Farmers are expected to apply with EPA standards as well for clean air. You have food safety standards that come in with regard to the integrity of that eggshell and whether or not it won't have contaminants or risk of contamination of the eggshell. There's a multitude of things that happen. You have the workers within that, that system that have to either breathe the air that, uh, that in fact may affect them with regard to their culinary. So it's for, I know for me as a scientist, I view this more in a complex system status now than I did in a singular, well, a single dimension status with regard to what is the animal not only what the animal is doing, but it's how well is the rest of the system doing as well. And how do we sustain the system so that farmers can still make a living, that we are accommodating for things that are important to be accommodated with regard to animal welfare, but also are we not putting them into a catch-22 with regard to the other compliance issues that they need to be able to meet with regard to the So um, I've appreciated the CFI model with regard to this. Uh, you know, We've had the opportunities to work together. Um, I know in the early days, I never looked at a video, particularly because it was usually PETA or somebody calling me to look at the video. There was no way, number one, I couldn't tell whether they broke into the facility. I didn't want to be part of the criminal activity. Um, I had no control over what the quality of that video was. I had no idea if there was any editing. In some cases, it looked like those videos were taken in older facilities. I didn't do it, but under a more controlled uh, scenario where there are there is an intermediary that is assuring, for example, if we can get the whole thing in this way, that I have other colleagues that are engaged in it, I, would, I feel much safer in terms of being able to render an opinion in that, but also understand that uh, it's going to be filtered correctly with regard to its release. So that's all I'm going to have to say. Thank you. I just uh, like to share a couple of things. I I remember uh, the Boss Hog series, as a matter of fact, because I'm on that whole 25 years in the industry thing too, Dr. Thompson, so yeah. It's your belly check. But I remember I was working at Local Farms when that was released, and uh, it was very, very painful. We didn't know what to do. That was a, a first time for us. As a matter of fact, I think there are a lot of jobs today in the industry um, that did not exist at that time simply because the industry has evolved so much. And so given that, I come from a farming background, you will come from a farming background, I am interested to know um, how, how many times have you found that there has been actual abuse versus just unattractive best practices as we like to call them? That's, that's a fair, fair question. I'm not sure I can give a percentage on that part, but um, 
actually early on it was mostly abuse. It was it was a, a, a criticism of the actions of workers on the farm. And unfortunately, we can find cases where there are people or there's complainants who have worked on the farm that have pointed out quite, in some cases, egregious activities. And I remember some of the early videos out of North Carolina that, that, that we had to point out and, and make, that, uh, make that point. What has happened is that the, the, the activist groups who have made the videos aren't interested in critiquing the individual anymore because that they don't find that it affects changes. And so they're creating criticisms more of the system and more of, of aspects that they feel that um, especially those holding brand equity can actually force change, whether it be housing systems, whether it be, um, in some cases, euthanasia and, and, and transport. And so I, I think it's actually the critics who have changed the weighting with, within those videos. Yeah, I, I would anticipate uh, Kirk seems to be fine with it. But, um, yeah, I think the early days, and, and I agree with John on this, the early days it was most, the most egregious acts that we typically would have on our film. And in many cases, uh, it would lead one to think that actually there were people inside the, um, the operation that were also upset about this and actually had contacted organizations on one side. I think that was true in North Carolina. That they went to people, or they went to the SUS, or they went to one of those who were for animals, and they actually gave them the lead that this is happening on this facility and can't stand it anymore. Something. And so they would infiltrate, and uh, that's that's the way it happened. These days, I'm seeing far more of the standard uh, agricultural practices being brought up, you know, castration, farming, uh, things like that, that are being criticized and looked at. I know some of the videos we looked at. Um, some of these were, were standard practices, uh, and they have been accepted. So now it's going to the level of the actual agricultural practices as well. The other addition to this, I think, uh, is the environmental piece that is frequently being brought up more and more, particularly water use by agricultural animals, uh, the conflict between what we reserve for human use and what we have for animal use. Some of this is being uh, exploited out of some of the water work, works that are happening. Industry in Western Kansas and the Oklahoma Aquifer, the Republican River debate that continues in the farm, and also looking at the Rio Grande in Mexico and its drying up chemicals being used to build up agriculture. It's frequently being more uh, talked about and brought in, for example, even on our college campuses. We've had a lot of discussions that go on with respect to this. Uh, many of us who have lost schools have a few weeks now that are now. Some of them have walked off to the Indian that's going to save the world. It's going to save your fresh water resources. It's going to save you know, a whole lot of other things. So people want a simplistic solution to all these issues. And unfortunately, there is no simplistic solution in the rest of the world. And the fortune is incredibly to be meaningful with this regard to the nutrition. Um, so I, I think, you know, really with regard to these, in the beginning, I'd say a lot of them were centered on just uh, out and out abuse, which of course it should not be happening. It's happened here in the state of Ohio as well, which has a very dark history. Now it's, it's starting to move into that area of the standard agricultural practices that have been accepted for a long time. So I can't put a percentage on it either. Let's go. That's going to be after all this. Yeah, and, and no doubt it has evolved. I think you all um, have a copy of the, uh, an actual panel review. And so I shared this one with you. I realized it came out in 2013, but this actually 
had um, input from uh, Dr. Swanson and Dr. Fain. Yeah, it was. So, a long time ago. It, it, was, it was just one of the uglier ones that we had. Exactly, but I mean, you know, yeah. just look at the good, the bad, you know. Um, I, I grew up on a farm as well. And um, what I have seen, mm -hmm. uh, and I worked in the pork industry for some time, but what I have seen is that now that I work in an association, I found, find that I'm working with a lot of individuals that did not grow up on a farm. And so when we would get a video like this, I would look at it and I would see things very differently than they saw them. And so when we would always say, look at that through the minds of the consumer, I honestly thought that's what I was doing, but in fact, I must not have because we had employees that would say, I, I can't look at that. And, and it, I know that for a fact, it was just a standard best practice in the industry, but they could not even view the video because it was so disturbing to them. So <coughs> that looking through the eye of the consumer is not always as easy as it sounds. One more question I have, and then I promise I will let um, others ask a question. But how many uh, abuses that you've seen, or um, maybe best practices, could have been avoided had we had time, uh, timely intervention? You know, this is this is a, a tough one. It's one I think we, we have to work with on the communities on all the time. Inherently, <coughs> I think. Most of us don't want to have to make that terrible decision of putting it in the oven. Right? Uh, for some, it's easy for others. But there's always the idea in the back of the mind that maybe this animal will recover. Now, it can be put into double the assessment, it can be put into the fact that this is a valuable animal to the herd, and then in fact, you don't want to make a We don't want to do that. Um, so the little Little bit like, not completely like, making the decision to put your dog in A lot of it centers on our experience, and we're focusing more on what we're feeling, and not necessarily what might be in other people's minds. We don't want to put this animal to sleep, we don't want to, you know, it's that sort of thing. So the destruction of an animal is not an easy decision to make. However, what I find is sometimes they don't quite know when to pull that trigger and make the decision because they don't know when we cross over from the time, I think earlier we do, when we cross over from the time of being recoverable to the moment. And I think having a decision tree, something that somebody could, could grab onto to get to the point where they can, and I know there's been some of those challenges too, that says, at this point, this animal is not recoverable to me. Gives people permission to go ahead and do it. But I know a lot of farmers and ranchers don't like having to go through that decision process in terms of putting money down. It, it's a, a loss of profit to them, but it's also a loss of the value of the herd and the flock. And uh, that's when the ugliness starts, is when you have an animal suffering, you're sitting out in a sick pen somewhere, someone's not paying attention to that sick pen because sometimes it's easier if they're out of sight. Those are places that, that people would gravitate to to make that video shot. And you need to really be sure you pay attention to those sick animals and you compare them if you think they're going to be the recovery stories or something. Compare them to that point in a way that, that you can actually recover that animal and get them back into the herd. But there's a lot of things I think that happen that way. Right. I get it. I don't think in most, my experiences in most cases, that the videos don't focus on timely euthanasia as an issue because the activist organizations don't want to be associated with euthanasia and arguing for higher rates of euthanasia on, on the farm. So it's more just that quick clip right. that indicts the, the um, farm. And, and we need to get rid of uh, those illustrations. And, and it comes up time and time again in our our uh, assessments within um, the National Pork Board, two A plus as as a major issue. Um, two two points. Um, num number one is we need to have a sensitivity over the issue. My mom would say, "Can you look at at that cr at, at crate number fourteen in the bearing house?" And, and she didn't say anything more, but she knew she wanted me to do 
euthanized pigs. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we can completely combine uh, uh, an ability to euthanize animals and, and the care that we expect from them. And, and frankly, we have problems, especially in the right. so, yeah. so, so we, we struggle with it, and we need to discuss it and, and make it part of our our, our um, discussion center. The the second point is is, and, and it's hard to explain, especially market hog of two hundred pounds and youth and methods of euthanasia that are equally effective on uh, humans, and, and so the safety issues need to be discussed, and it's an interesting discussion if it gets out into a public domain on how we keep it safe and still make it efficacious and easy to do, and we are in that now. Again, my thoughts. No, it, it is, it's really good. We have questions. Can you work with your viewers and the video and the rooms, and what is the process We don't have anybody that works on um, the forensics of the clip analysis. So, um, because somebody mentioned the cell phones that they have in the house, not quite reflected, and obviously that's the reason why they have cell phones. I don't know. No, but what we have found um, is that as you look at that video, it doesn't. Um, smoothly progress, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so you will have clips of this and clips of this. Um, as far as the justice piece, no, we do not, we have not referred anyone, we do not do that. Um, but certainly we would hope that the commodity group would look at this report and say, yes, this was, requires um, a larger and much greater step as far as the Yes. If that's what they say. Um, yeah. I mean, we only synthesize their input. We have to do that to make sure that it maintains credibility. Okay. And I might add, we, we only talk about what we actually see. And we try to be as clear as we can about what we see. But we don't have any reservations about what we see. We try to express that. Saying that it could be a, we're not positive that this is happening. This may not be reflective of what. Well, we don't get involved in the work of no, Typically, these are the goal. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't, we, we talk about it in a reserved manner, but we don't actually know. Unless you get the full clip all right, from the organization, it's difficult to be ready for. So what we talk about is what we actually see is on the clips as they're reported. It's up to somebody else to, if it does go into law enforcement, in some cases it do, this is something that's been reported out to law enforcement, but that, that's up to law enforcement to be able to look at that and, and the lawyers and the ones that are involved with it to see whether or not they can secure the full length of the, of the video that they sent. But at this point, if the CFR has no power to get that from them, it's only if they're willing to yeah, but they can only comment on that. Which that's all we call it. Any other questions? Yes. So if, if that piece that clip you're looking at is supposed to be a falsified, should you come to some kind of call meeting? To my knowledge, no. Are you all aware? We have seen some of those, so I know I've seen several, but I'm not familiar with the health. So I was wondering why health are you were receiving legal action against a animal activist? So I, I think there was at one point, but it wasn't on farm. I think one of the daily got into something with regard to one of the organizations who was 
gifts, they made that allegation. I can't remember how it came out, but I think they really did require a court to do something. The names were in fact, they were just representations of the accused. There is what you bring up, probably for me, and so it's something to really sort of address that. When you look at the theory that they were guilty of the groups, it really would be the same. They could have just accused their client of being a client of the group. Thank you. Yeah, and it may be difficult, and this is just Allison's speculation, okay? So take that for what it's worth. But it may be difficult to quantify the true loss from that video. Yes, yes. I think as it relates to that, if you've noticed or paid attention to the news in the last week or two, you all remember the lean finely textured beef situation and pink slime and the fact that that is actually being taken up and it's either a North or South Dakota courtroom here over the next few weeks. I think the outcome of that and what the monetary value, if there's a monetary value that's been placed on it, but if anything comes to fruition, will determine how some of these other future situations play out. I do think it is a monetary situation. You know how deep the farmer's pockets are compared to the organizations that are attacking them that ultimately makes the decision what it is for the farmer to have to pay. I do think that outcome on the lean finely textured beef really is. Is there time? I think so. Yes, go ahead. Do you think that the judge was looking at the video for an I think there's two points. Number one is, first of all, going back to the farm and asking, did this happen? Is the first measure. And we usually don't have time to do a complete analysis with the farm owner or the farm managers of what has happened. But in retrospect, frankly, I haven't found any that have been staged. The real question comes up with the plant who's doing the filming, whether or not that person has adequately represented the law and inhibited those activities or in some ways allowed them to go forward. And that's a consistent question because often there's a lag of six to eight months between the time of the film and the release, usually associated with a shareholder meeting or something of that sort. And who has the responsibility of that lag if the complainant actually states that this is an illegal activity? And it's actually been pretty handy to take that lag and say, even HSUS doesn't consider it that important. Because they delayed in releasing the information. Yeah. So if you were truly concerned, why did you not bring this to our attention immediately? Exactly. And I understand your question about the analysis, and I think it's a legitimate concern. But I would say if you look at it from a retailer standpoint, they have been shared that piece of the video, and it is on that piece of the video that they're going to react to. And so that is what we try to address. Even if they did an analysis and they found perhaps this is staged, the damage is done by the release. And so it needs to be addressed by professionals so that at least the retailer has some recourse to tell consumers, listen, we were concerned about that too. We had experts look at it. Here's what they found. And we are addressing it. We'll be glad to share this with you. There were concerns in the video, and we will be addressing that with our suppliers. And lots of times that is enough for a truly concerned consumer. But we have found that the activist groups are hijacking this process. And so they're getting their own video, and they're getting their own experts, and they've used some of our experts, which they're not really our experts, but experts in the field. Just one of the frustrating things that we deal with here in Ohio with our livestock care standards, which are law, is that we often overlap with our humane societies. I deal with the humane societies. I deal with animal abuse, and we deal with the care standards. And it's frustrating in that humane societies kind of have their hands tied because it's very rare you'll get a prosecuting attorney 
they will prosecute. It's very frustrating. Well, we work, we work in Canada with Humane Societies. The problem, what we've seen over the last couple of years is that Humane Societies uh, are involved, we'll go out with them as right. well. If they don't feel they have the backing, we do it for them. That's the issue. Yeah, that's so true. what we end up getting is all the phone calls into us instead of the Humane Societies. And our, our penalties are civil penalties. And so it, it just really is frustrating. Are the humane societies that you're referring to tied into uh, HSUS? Maybe no. I didn't think so. Okay. Uh, all of ours okay. are county right. Uh, all right. humane societies. Sort of like what we would call an animal show. Right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I'm interested in the uh, changing tactics that you talked about in the activist groups. Why do you think that's happening? Why is there a change? I mean, it's a little leading, but do you think it's because consumers are Well, I mean, I guess just from the history of it, watching it evolve over time, there was a time when we did have conversations in the ag community with uh, an entity like the Humane Society of the United States. There used to be a group of people within the Humane Society of the United States who actually were devoted to agricultural and animal concerns and a background. I think what happened over the years is the digging in the heels, not wanting to entertain those hard conversations, and then the building of frustration. So when the opportunity came, and there was somebody savvy enough to recognize that there needed to be a, a different political process that was followed, inserted themselves into that organization and changed the whole concept of that organization. And so what used to be an organization to dialogue with them, and try to, to move the ball a bit, um, became one that said, heck, we're tired of doing that. We're not moving the ball the way we want to. So what we're going to do is fire all the science people within the organization and replace them with lawyers. <coughs> and you had some examples that were already set up uh, with regard to the use of the, uh, in this case, it wasn't necessarily the food retailers, but for example, the cosmetic industry that was being used a long time ago when a gentleman by the Spirit, who was hand handling, uh, I think it was Animal Rights International at the time, but he used a, a kind of a soft flattering approach with Revlon and the rest of them, Procter and Gamble, in which he wanted to have the conversation with them. If they shut the door on him, he ran a full length ad in the New York Times, did one of the for the sake of reading at the store. This happened in days. And it was very effective at bringing Procter and Gamble, Revlon, and the rest of them to start talking about the use of animal in testing for things like cosmetics and so on. And as a result, they came together and they put together a uh, center at Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University called the Center, center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. And there they came together and funded projects in which they were able to do things. Well, it, it set in place an idea that we don't need to use the legislature. We just need to go to big ones who actually buy or produce those products and make them responsible for what happens to animals in there. So, you know, after he died, what happened is Peter picked it up and 
they started into this, uh, and very slowly it got picked up by others and said, we're going to have a conversation with McDonald's, we're going to have a conversation with Amy, we're going to have a conversation there, and we're going to move, we're going to move somewhere with this, because suddenly they're going to have to look at it and they're going to have to change it. So we started with the slaughterhouse in back in the late 80s, and then it's moved, progressively moved from there. And they have moved from here, no doubt about it. They've moved from I just add that um, I, I think we have a conflict in in, um, in the argument with, with critics. I think the critics want to argue systematic problems in animal agriculture and focus on the system. And, and so I, I think we are seeing a bias away from focusing on individuals, including charging them, and, and focusing on systematic areas and really a vilification of decision making not even the actual decisions. Industrial agriculture does not, it's like industrial medicine. And, and we gotta come back to an argument that animal agriculture is made up of people. Every time I go now to a uh, 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 meeting that is trying to criticize animal agriculture, I try to bring along a caregiver from a farm in Minnesota. Because it's much more difficult to vilify individuals than it is un, un, um, uninvolved uh, corporate citizens and shareholders. And, and they're going to play that back and forth, I think, for weeks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I thank you very much. Let me thank our panelists. Well, we are running a few minutes ahead of schedule, which is okay. Um, so we had a, a couple of typos from the timing standpoint in the schedule, and we are scheduled to go much later than the uh, than the other two uh, councils, uh, you know, during in the, in the lunchtime a little bit. So, but uh, if you're okay, we're going to stop and break here, and then uh, we will pick right back up on the agenda. It's um, about 9:45, so let's try to get back in here about 10 o'clock. That'll be 15 minutes, and uh, um, we'll uh, we'll get started back up then. So, Thank you. Say hi. It's been a while. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. 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 So you're still working? And, uh, yep. No future plans on the time Yeah, yeah. No, it, like you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've been on the road for the last several years. Yeah. 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 Yeah, go right Yes. 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 Yes.